God's word and to Paul's letter to the Galatians. Galatians and chapter 6. It's quite a short chapter, just 18 verses, so I'll read from verse 1 to the end of the chapter. So Paul's letter to Galatians, chapter 6, verse 1 to 18. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfil the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows in his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us now not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. For now, from now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Please turn back to Paul's letter to the Galatians. And it is mainly verse 14 in chapter 6 that I want to draw your attention to. Though we will also need to look at verse 12 and 13 briefly. But before we do that, let me just set the scene. From the very start of this letter, Paul is dealing with a problem at this church in Galatia. I say this church, there were several of them in that region. What's the problem? Well, he, through his missionary endeavours, had founded the church in that area. But there were others who'd now come in, Paul having left and moved on to other places to minister the gospel, and others had come in, particularly from Jerusalem, who said they were Christians, but also said that Paul's message was not correct. It needed to be changed. He had preached Jesus Christ crucified for sin and risen again, ascended to the Father to present his blood so that the Father would pronounce his satisfaction upon it and justify all those who came to him in the name of Christ. That, in summation, was Paul's message. But these others, who are sometimes known as Judaizers, said that, oh no, you need something else besides that. 
You need to obey the Jewish law, and especially you need to be circumcised. And here Paul touches again on that issue. It runs right through the epistle. You've got it particularly in the first chapter where he tells them that if they turn to another gospel, it's not another gospel at all. But here in the closing verses, he comes back to the main problem. So verse 12 to verse 14, what do we find? Well, in verse 12 and verse 13, he reminds them about this false message that was coming from these Judaizers. Verse 12. And as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. These, he's referring to, are these Judaizers. And they came in the flesh. In other words, they came with a worldly message. A message devised by man, not by God. That's what he means here, by the flesh. And they were compelling them to be circumcised. Why? Well, they didn't want to suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So by delivering a different message, they hoped they would avoid that. But then he goes on in verse 13 to say a bit more about these Judaizers. For even those who are circumcised, not even they keep the law. But they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. They told these people to obey the law which had been put forward by the Jews. But they didn't necessarily obey it in full themselves, but they were insisting upon circumcision. Why? So that they may boast in their triumph in having dealt with these people so that they would receive the message they gave. They were boasting in their ability to bring these Christians into line with their own thinking. Now, in contrast to all of that, the Apostle Paul was entirely different. Instead of fearing persecution for the cross, he gloried in the cross. Instead of boasting in his triumph over these Galatian Christians, and many of them, if not all of them, had come to faith in Christ through his ministry, so he had a lot to boast of. Instead of doing that, he says, I boast in the cross of Christ. So in verse 14, he then focuses upon himself in contrast to these Judaizers. And what does he say? God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world was crucified to me, and I to the world. Now we'll come to this expression, the cross, in a moment, because we need to know exactly what he means by it. But at the end of this verse, he tells us something about himself. He says... He has been crucified to the world. He's died to the world. What does he mean by that? Well, he's thinking here about all the honours and all the acclamation that you get from the world. All the praise you get from men. There are those who like to glory, for instance, in their qualifications and in their education, in their background, in their upbringing, and all the rest of it. And they think themselves better than others because of it. And the apostles say, I die to all of that. I'll have nothing more to do with it. But he then goes on to say, because of that, because he no longer holds the honours and the acclamation of this world in high esteem, the world has died to him. In other words, it despises him. He was this man who was doing nothing but preaching this gospel. And they regarded him as foolish because of that. So here's this contrast between what these Judaizers were doing, false teachers in other words, and the Apostle Paul. And it's all to do with this expression that he repeats 
in these verses the cross and we need to ask ourselves what does he mean by the cross now let me just remind you of a few things at this point nearly 20 years ago now I remember the news media being full of a story somebody who worked for British Airways as it was then was forbidden to wear a cross at work and there was quite a fuss made of it in various places I suppose we've forgotten all about that now more recently I've been reading some history with regard to the Middle Ages and I'm sure many of you have heard of the Crusades well in the year 1095 950 years ago the Pope to be precise Pope Urban II sent out a call to all professing Christians to the whole of what historians refer to as Christendom what was the call he wanted them to take up the cross why he wanted them to take up arms and go to the east and fight against those who were professing a different religion now you can read about all that yourself by picking up an appropriate history book but the point was all those who went out on those crusades to fight for what the Pope was urging them to fight for took the cross that was the thing that they identified themselves with now what did they mean by that what does the Bible mean by the cross what does Paul mean by the cross here well scripture speaks of the cross in three different ways sometimes it's referring simply to the wood upon which the saviour died that Roman gibbet as we might describe it that was the cross and over the years again back in the middle ages that item was venerated people would do all they could to get a fragment of the cross and they would literally worship it now Paul doesn't mean that here he would regard that as idolatry which indeed it is but then scripture speaks of the cross in a different way sometimes it refers to it when describing the sufferings of the Christian take up your cross and follow me there it's a reference to what Christians must endure in following Christ because they will be despised and hated by others now that's not Paul's concern here his concern here is the teaching of these Judaizers the doctrine that they were presenting so that brings us to the third scriptural use of the term the cross and it is most frequently used in the New Testament in this way it is used to refer to Christ's death the shedding of his own blood taking our place on the cross and bearing the wrath of God as a sacrifice satisfying the justice of God so that we might be forgiven sometimes we refer to that as the atonement yes. that is most commonly the use of the term the cross in the New Testament let me demonstrate that to you in the letter to the Colossians Paul describes it this way in Colossians 1 and verse 20 speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of God the Father through him he says this and by him to reconcile all things to himself that is God through Christ has reconciled all things to himself by him whether things on earth or things in heaven 
having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now clearly, that is a reference to Christ's death, the blood of his cross. And Paul is undoubtedly using this term here in Galatians in that sense. He is contrasting the doctrine of the sufferings of Christ upon the cross with what these Judaizers were teaching. And he's saying quite simply, I boast in the one, they boast in the other. And the question that you and I need to ask this morning is, what is it we are boasting in? Are we boasting in the cross or in something else? Are we boasting in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ or in something different to that? And that's what I want us to take up. You perhaps remember the line of the hymn, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. I could have chosen that hymn for this morning. It would have been most appropriate, but there are others I've gone for instead. Well, there are two things here that I want us to focus on. First of all, Paul himself. He makes this statement so very clearly. God forbid that I should boast except in the cross. Now what kind of a man was he? What kind of a man would say something like that? We might think, well, perhaps he was nobody. A nothing. Had nothing to boast of as far as himself was concerned. Nothing could be further from the truth. So let's just think about Paul himself for a few minutes before we move on. Think about his achievements, both before he became a Christian and after it. First of all, before he became a Christian, his national heritage. This man was a Jew, a Hebrew, and he describes himself as a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was, when he trained as a young man, a Pharisee. He was one of those religious leaders in Jerusalem. And he tells us that himself when he writes his letter to the Philippians. In chapter 3 of that letter, and in verse 4 to 6, he says this, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, and again he's using this word flesh to refer to something regarding ourselves without God. He says, I might have confidence in the flesh. I might have confidence in myself other than God. What does he say about that? If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. He's telling the people he's writing to here, he can have more confidence in what he was as a person more than they could. Why is that? Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That was his heritage. These same people who'd come to the Galatian church were Pharisees in nature. And Paul originally was one of them. And what's more, he was one of, and I put the word in inverted commas, the best of them. In the sense that he conformed to their way of life more than any of them did. He was a man with incredible scriptural knowledge. He had trained, as we know this from what is told, we are told in the book of Acts, he had trained under the teaching of a man called Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was revered in Jerusalem as one of the greatest teachers of the Jewish law. Indeed, it was said by some that when Gamaliel died, 
respect for the Torah died. The Torah being an expression for the Old Testament scriptures. And Paul was his prized student, his star pupil. Well then, he becomes a Christian. And all that goes by the wayside. What about his work as a Christian? His spiritual gifts? No man preached the gospel more than this man did. He lived, ate and breathed the preaching of the gospel from the very day he was converted onwards. Now we are told in the New Testament that others regarded his speech as contemptible. And we're not sure whether it was that he had some speech impediment or not. But he wasn't a great orator. However, the word he delivered was powerful because it was anointed by the Spirit of God. Amen. And then there's the word that he wrote. You pick up your New Testament and something like two-thirds of it come from the pen of this man Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, who else could boast about that? That is his spiritual experience. He tells us on one occasion he was taken up to the third heaven and heard words that were unutterable. No man could hear them. Then is his Christian works, his labours. He founded churches in every part of the Roman Empire. And we have the record of many of them in the scriptures. Ephesus, Philippi, Galatia, Corinth, Thessalonica. They're all here. And there were many others besides. And then his Christian graces. This man was loved by other Christians. In the Acts of the Apostles, and in Acts chapter 20, there is a very, very touching occasion recorded. On one of his journeys, he stopped at Ephesus, the place where he had formerly founded a church. And he met with the elders of the church and ministered to them. And then we read this in verse 36 and verse 37 of Acts chapter 20. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. That was what they felt about him. He was the man who brought to them the very word of life that had delivered them from the clutches of Satan. Now Paul could have boasted in any of that. He could have boasted in what he was before becoming a Christian. He could equally have boasted in all the things that he had done and was doing as a Christian. But he doesn't. Let me go back to what we have in that third chapter of Philippians and read on a little further. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith do you see where he's come to in his life it doesn't matter what he's done in the past it doesn't matter what he's doing now there's only one thing that really matters to him and that is that Christ Jesus has rescued him from his sin. Christ Jesus has given to him a righteousness that enables him to stand before God. 
Not his own righteousness. Not a righteousness that he has produced by working through the things of the law and trying to obey them, but a righteousness which is a gift coming from the Saviour himself, the Saviour's own righteousness, his own obedience, is now Paul's. And he stands before God clothed in it that he might be accepted by God. Now, I touched on these things last time I was here from the Old Testament when we looked at uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. You may well not remember, it was some time ago, but nevertheless we did. And the question is, where do we all stand? J.C. Ryle has a very important statement that needs repeating. This is what he said. Open sin kills thousands, but self-righteousness kills tens of thousands. One of the worst of sins is to think that we have something of ourselves to commend us to God. And that, of course, can be equally true of the worst of people and also those that we might think of in human terms as being the best of people. In fact, perhaps more so the latter than the former because the latter may think they have something to boast of. But they have nothing. But in Christ, we have everything. And that's the Apostle's boast. And of course, he was concerned about this Galatian church because they were being persuaded and allured and tempted to take up something else and leave behind what they had learned of Christ. So there's the first point then. No one had more to boast than the Apostle Paul, but he counted it all as rubbish. The old authorised version is a bit stronger. It says, I count them but dung. A mess on the floor that you don't even want to go near. That's how he regarded his achievements. But then... Christ was everything to him. The Lord Jesus Christ was his only ground of confidence to come before God. It was the only divinely appointed means he'd ever received from God by which he could build the church. And what is more, and this is quite humbling and sobering when we think of it, Christ Jesus, the cross, was the very thing that the Apostle Paul regarded as being worth suffering for. Indeed, he counted it to be an honour to suffer for Christ. When we think very carefully about ourselves and measure ourselves against such a man, perhaps we begin to see how far we fall short and how much we need God to deal with us to bring us to that point that this man came to. Well, let me come to a second point, and that is the glory of the cross itself. Let's think for a few minutes about what is so wonderful about the cross, and remember what we mean by it. By the cross we are referring to the death and suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, the shedding of his blood, whereby he takes our place, becomes, as we say, our substitute, and receives instead of us the wrath of God and satisfies it fully, and gives to us in return not the wrath of God, but his own righteousness, so that we can stand before God. That's what we mean by the cross. Well, let me begin by saying this. And I find it very saddening. And I hope I'm not going to find it here. And I think probably not. But there are places 
where you can go and preach a gospel message. Where Christians think, unless unbelievers are present, that you shouldn't be doing that. And you do find that some preachers, especially with the state of the church as it is today, whereby we've been whittled down to very small numbers, and unbelievers don't tend to come into a place of worship, perhaps occasionally they do, but generally speaking they don't, you do find that some preachers go out to take the scriptures, assuming that no unbelievers are present, and never preach the cross. Now there's much in scripture you can preach. If we go back to the passage that we read, there are reminders here. The apostle says to us, for instance, in verse 2 of Galatians 6, we need to bear one another's burdens. Well, there's a sermon there. And then he goes on to say, for if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Again, there's a sermon there. There are many things that can be preached from scripture which are necessary to preach. We must deliver the whole counsel of God. But at the heart of it all is the cross. And there's a real danger. And I think especially now at this present time with the church as she is of us losing sight of the cross. I was preaching in another fellowship a few weeks ago. One that I very much doubt you know of. And I preached a gospel message, pure and simple. And there were some who were quite surprised that I did that. And they were a lovely group of Christians. And yet I could tell that with some of them, they were thinking, why is he preaching this to me? I hope and trust you are not thinking the same. Because... We are to glory in the cross. And that means simply hearing the truth of it should thrill us, yes. if nothing else. Well, let me say a few more things about that. The cross is in the scriptures from beginning to end. Again, let me say what I remind you of before. Back in July, I preached on Galatians, uh, sorry, not Galatians, Genesis 3, verse 21. Remember the text. There we are told that God made clothes for Adam and Eve and had to slay animals to provide them. A sacrifice, blood was shed, that they might be covered and their nakedness hidden. And there's the gospel, there's the cross. So it's there right at the start. Then you come to something like Leviticus chapter 16, which is all about the Old Testament ceremonies of the priest, the high priest, going into the temple, into the tabernacle as it was then, and offering the sacrifice before God to make atonement for the sins of the people. The whole of that chapter is all about the cross, and it isn't just in that one chapter. Well, then you come to the days of our Saviour, before his public ministry. You remember in the very first chapter of John's Gospel, when John clapped eyes on him as he was walking before the crowd. Do you remember his words? Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. He could have said, look, here's the best of men. Absolutely true. Look, here's the one who is without any offence to others. Absolutely true. Look, he is the one who knows more about God than any of us do. Absolutely true. But no, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The cross. And you've got it right at the end of Scripture. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. Listen to this. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll to loose its seven seals. And I looked, 
And behold, in the midst of the throne, and out of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. There's a reminder in the closing chapters of our, of our Bible, telling us that the Holy Spirit has gone throughout all the earth to proclaim the cross. A lamb slain for sin. Well, another point that we need to grasp. The cross displays two things better than anything else ever would. The wisdom of God and the power of God. And again, the Apostle Paul is full of that truth. When he wrote to the Corinthians, and in the first chapter, from verse 22 onwards, he says this, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, man's wisdom, not God's wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God why is the cross the power of God the whole of creation is the power of God of course it is but why particularly the cross because it conquers sinful hearts and reconciles rebellious mankind to God and there is nothing else in the entire universe that can do that why is it the wisdom of God because it brings together in perfect harmony the justice of God sin is punished in Christ Jesus and God's justice is upheld imagine a God who wasn't just Imagine a God who didn't deal with sin, who didn't punish it and give it what it deserves. Well, God has done that in his own son, who's taken our place. And join that to perfect mercy, because in that he gives forgiveness and salvation to those who believe. Another factor that we need to grasp, to glory in, the cross is the one element in Christianity which is unique. No other religion has anything like it. Every other religion will bring to you some teacher who tells you what you must do to offer yourself to God. But the Bible tells us that Christ has offered himself yes. to God on our behalf. What a huge chasm between them. Absolutely unbridgeable. And it's that probably that prevents many from coming into the church without the power of God. Give them a religion which has no cross and tells them there's something they can do to make themselves acceptable to God and many will welcome it. And they are doing throughout all the world in the various forms of religion that have been invented by mankind. But tell them that they can't do that. It's impossible. Tell them that there is nothing they can do whatsoever, not one single thing that will ever satisfy the law of God and his demands. And immediately, pride ruffles their feathers and they turn away in disgust. It's the very thing that separates true religion from false. And how we need the power of God through the Holy Spirit to deliver that truth so that hearts that naturally rebel against it welcome it.
So let me close by just saying this. Three things. Beware of religion without the cross. And there's a lot of it. The soul is dead without it. We come into this world dead in our trespasses and sins. In other words, we have no knowledge of God whatsoever. We are dead as far as spiritual things are concerned. And that's where we stay. Unless we take hold of Christ Jesus and what he's done to deliver us. Worship is a sham without the cross. Earlier I was mentioning some things that had taken place in the Middle Ages when the Pope sent out that call. I wonder how many of us like to go and visit those ancient church buildings that were constructed in those days. Fine Gothic structures with beautiful stonework soaring up into the heavens. Like York Minster for instance and so many others. They're wonderful to look at. That's how people thought you should worship God. But today we've got the same problem, you know. Today, people think we can't worship God without some profound use of technology. We have to light up the church in special ways and all the rest of it. Beware of religion without the cross. You cannot worship God without it. He will not accept you in his presence. Unless we come in Christ Jesus and by Christ Jesus, God sends us packing. But thank God that he is the one who takes us into the presence of the Father. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, by whom we also have access into his presence. And then very finally, missionary work is empty and hopeless without the cross. I'm hesitating here. I need to be careful. I've never gone onto the mission field. So I don't know from experience the difficulties that it presents. And I'm sure it presents many. But I do hear of some missionaries. And when you speak to them or hear about their testimony and their work and all the rest of it. They seem to be doing something else other than preaching the cross. Some kind of social work or whatever it is. Now how did the Apostle Paul take this message a little while ago I mentioned how he was received by the elders of the church at Ephesus when he knelt down with them to pray but if you go back a little further in that very same chapter of Acts chapter 20 and especially into Acts chapter 19 and beyond, you discover what happened when he preached in those places like Ephesus. Acts chapter 20 and verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them and departed to go to Macedonia. What had happened? He'd been in Ephesus preaching. And there was a riot took place because of it. How dare this man tell us that our goddess Diana of the Ephesians is no goddess at all. And they wanted to lynch him and string him up. And it wasn't just in Ephesus. Go back to Acts chapter 17. He was treated in exactly the same way at Thessalonica when he preached there and in every place he went what was his practice well the first thing he would do is he would go into the synagogue and reason with them from the scriptures presenting Christ Jesus and the cross 
and showing that this is what the scriptures taught. And invariably, they ended up throwing him out. And so he would then preach to the Gentiles and all those who would hear. And thank God that many did, but not all of them. And from one place and then to another and then to another, he sowed the seeds of truth and established places of true worship, but was driven out and had to move on to another. Why? Because he preached the cross. And the world doesn't like it. And we need to face up to that. The world does not like the message we have got. But we do also have one who is the giver of that message. Almighty God. And when his power rests upon us, as it did upon this apostle and others, then that message bears fruit. It will also stir up opposition. It always does. But it will bear fruit. And we are in a time and a day and an age where the church needs fruit. Otherwise, she will cease to exist in this country within a matter of a few decades. Because we've grown so few in number. And one thing we need to do is plead with God that he will send out those with this message but anoint them with his power so that when they preach all the opposition that is hurled against the truth is broken and souls are captured for Christ. And if we can do nothing else that is our task, to plead with God that he will do that in this time that we live in and change these days in which we dwell. So with that, let's just pray.